Welcome to another video supporting our series at Westminster called Who Do You Say I Am? Encountering the Newer Testament. Today's topic is the Gospel according to Luke, and Margaret and I are really happy to welcome Raj Nadella. Raj is the Samuel A. Cartledge Associate Professor of New Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in lovely Decatur, Georgia, one of our Presbyterian seminaries. Uh, and a friend to both Margaret and to me. Raj, thanks for being here to talk about Luke. Well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation, Matt and Margaret. And it's a delight to be with you and with the good folks at Westminster. Great. Let's jump right into it. Uh, people have presumably been introduced to or have read Mark and then Matthew, and now we get Luke's gospel. What should they be looking for as they read Luke? Like, what makes this 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 gospel distinctive? Um, how would you recommend? What 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 should we look for? Yeah, um, great question. Um, what makes Luke's distinctive vis-a-vis -vis other gospels? Um, I can think of uh, several things. Sure. Um, I will begin at the beginning. Um, at the beginning of the gospel, in the prologue, the author says, "Oh, Theophilus." Uh, in the past, many have attempted to write uh, an account of the life of Jesus, but I, Luke says, I'm going to write a systematic and orderly account of the life of Jesus. It's almost as if Luke is saying, yeah, the others attempted, they didn't do it. <laughs> Great job. I'm going, to write, I'm going to write like the historian. Yeah. So this is a claim that Luke is making, but it's not simply a claim. Luke actually tries to back it up by providing a whole lot of historical details. When Luke talks about uh, Annunciation stories, for instance, um, who was the emperor, who was the governor, all those details are included. And uh, when Luke introduces the ministry of John the Baptist, there are actually 10, almost 10 different rulers who are named and where they were ruling and so on. Mm -hmm. um, you read these details and say, it seems a little mundane, but... Luke is a historian, or at least that's how Luke sees himself or herself. Uh, so I think this attention to historical details uh, sets Luke apart. Mm -hmm. What is significant about the details is that uh, Luke is not simply narrating these details, but placing the story of Jesus in the context of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So a big question is, uh, Jesus is presenting this kingdom as, an, as, as the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. But as Luke tells the story of Jesus, this kingdom that is launched by Jesus is occurring in the context of the Roman Empire, but it will be characteristically different from the Roman Empire. <laughs> so that's one thing that I would say. A second thing I think that uh, makes Luke's distinct is... Uh, Luke and Jesus's explicit commitment to people at the margins. Mm -hmm. um, the gospel places a great deal of emphasis on people at the margins. There is the Magnificat, right, at the beginning. And then there is the Nazareth episode, which occurs in Mark and Matthew as well. But Luke alone has this, uh, um, uh, has this uh, quote from Isaiah that talks about uh, release for people at the margins. And you have the Beatitudes. And a, and a whole lot of characters in Luke's gospel, the tax collectors, for instance, the parable of the Samaritan and so on. I think all these stories put together uh, reveal Luke's commitment to people at the margins. Mm -hmm. I'll say one other thing really quickly. I think in Luke's gospel, the theme salvation occurs repeatedly. But what is, uh, it occurs in other Gospels too, but what is distinctive about Luke's Gospel is that uh, it's not tied to the death of Jesus at all. Mm -hmm. Salvation in Luke's Gospel occurs in the present, whether you look at Luke chapter 7, the story of the sinful woman, or the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus declares that salvation has come to them. So I find it interesting that Jesus is able to save people long before Jesus died on the cross. It has lots of theological implications. We don't have time to get into it, but I just wanted to highlight that as a distinctive feature. Yeah, it's so important, right? It helps us maybe think about incarnation and what's happening right. there. Like what is what is that? What, what does it mean for us? Right, right. Absolutely right. And how do we participate in that salvific process as people right. of God? There is that. 
This is so interesting, Raj. As you were thinking about this, I thought, but isn't Luke's gospel sort of structured in this sort of movement toward the cross, right? Mm -hmm. the, there's this sort of um, the time in Galilee, the time going towards Jerusalem, the time in Jerusalem. So where's what's happening in the crucifixion in in Luke's gospel if if it's not if that's not the sort of salvation event or how does he understand crucifixion? Right, right. I think we can certainly look at crucifixion through the lens of salvation. But as Luke tells the story, here is Jesus who announces the kingdom of God, which will be an alternative to the Roman Empire. It has different ethos, different worldview, and so on. And this uh, kingdom of God that Jesus inaugurated challenges the very ethos and practices of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Roman Empire is not going to sit back and smile at a challenge, a major challenge to, to its empire. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, Jesus, because of what he does, because of his uh, teaching and because of his uh, uh, ministry that challenges the Roman Empire gets into trouble with the Roman Empire. So, so the death of Jesus on the cross is because of what Jesus did as part of uh, proclaiming the kingdom of God. The um, the threat that he poses to the Romans it's partly about proclaiming a kingdom. But it's also along the way, he keeps telling people to do things that <laughs> that a lot of Romans probably would not want to do. I, I, um, so much mystery in the Gospels. There's so many places where Jesus says things that, that are kind of esoteric or can be interpreted in a variety of ways. But then every, now, every now and then in Luke, he'll say something like, none of you can be my disciple unless you give away all your possessions. And I'm like, right. well, that's pretty straightforward. Right. <laughs> it's also, <laughs> but it's also do, right? something uh, that is a bit of a challenge you know so i'm like my point is how does maybe the economics of this gospel figure yeah. into what you're talking about here right right, right. that's that's it that's a really really great question um right i really um, don't know the answer either so right I'm right right you know. um right yes yeah. so there is the um ruler right the rich ruler in 18 who um that he wants eternal life and Jesus tells him to sell his positions and give it to the poor. And of course, the rich ruler doesn't want to do that, right? It's not easy to do, right? So he yeah. goes away and Jesus says it's easier for a camel to enter God's kingdom than for rich people, right? Um, there is that. But then in the very next chapter, we have the story of Zacchaeus right? Zacchaeus encounters Jesus. And uh, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is so moved by this encounter that uh, without even being asked, he says, I'm going to give away half my property to half my wealth to the poor. And if I have wronged anyone, I'm going to return it fourfold to them. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, today salvation has come to you, right? Mm -hmm. so, so Zacchaeus really exhibits what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Zacchaeus really embodies the spirit of repentance here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think the story of Zacchaeus on some level goes back to the beginning of the gospel where John the Baptist is uh, preaching and uh, the baptism of repentance and all these uh, people from Jerusalem and Judea, wealthy people, right? They come to him and they say, what should we do? And what does John the Baptist say? He says, if you have two shirts, give one to someone who doesn't have it. Likewise, if you're a tax collector, don't collect any more than you're supposed to be. So I think, I think what uh, John the Baptist and later on Jesus also say is that uh, repentance and uh, participating in the kingdom of God and commitment to justice, these are not abstract ideas. Mm -hmm. Repentance is about facilitating a change, a difference, using the resources and the power that you have within your sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. So, so I think I think I think that's very that's that this theme runs throughout uh, throughout Luke's gospel. And if I might, uh, can I add uh, one more text, really? I don't know if we have time for it. Sure. Go for it. <laughs> well, I was going to say that uh, there is the story of uh, uh, the great banquet, uh, right? Luke chapter uh, 16, um, 14, 16. 
one of them, I forget, <laughs> um, where uh, people are uh, um, invited, right? And uh, um, the host is hosting this great banquet and uh, the, the really influential people are invited, right? And none of them show up. And when they fail to show up, uh, the host is so embarrassed that he actually sends his servants to, to go collect people at the street corners, the poor, the lame, the crippled, and the blind, and so on, right? Um, and oftentimes, this, this parable is interpreted as a parable about the kingdom of God. And a dominant interpretation of this parable is that the people who were originally invited and made excuses for not showing up were terrible people. They were terrible people because this is an eschatological banquet hosted by God. And if it is, if God is the host and you're invited to an eschatological banquet, how dare you not show up at the banquet? But if you look at the text that comes immediately before it, Jesus says to his audience, if you are hosting a ban banquet, don't invite the wealthy and the powerful. Invite the poor, the lame, the crippled, and the blind. And then he narrates this parable where the host initially doesn't invite any of these excluded groups. Only, only when the originally invited powerful people failed to show up was the host forced to invite the poor, the lame, and the crippled. I think the le a lesson of this parable is that uh, if you are wealthy and if you have influence, um, uh, don't in, don't just invite the wealthy and the powerful, invite the poor, the lame, and the crippled. But another lesson of this parable is that if you are invited to an exclusive banquet like this, don't show up. Don't show up. Make excuses for not showing up. Because when you make excuses and don't show up to an exclusive banquet, the host will be forced to open it up to the excluded communities like the poor, the lame, and the crippled. So I think I think a theme in Luke's gospel is people who are wealthy and powerful should leverage the privilege that they have to invite others into the kingdom. That's a lengthy response to your question. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. No, it's really helpful. Yeah. What um what is with all these banquets and dinners in Luke's gospel? Because they they seem to show up a lot, and some of them are are in parables, some of them are real. What is this sort of this? <laughs> what's the dinner party theme in in Luke? Yeah, uh, I think that's a that's a great question. I see um, banquets as metaphors for the social and political structures um, that we that we facilitate or that we participate in, in our, in our context. Because uh, banquets are about who, who gets to host, right? Who gets invited? Who doesn't get invited? And I think if we see them metaphorically, our socioeconomic structures are about who is the boss and who gets invited, who is excluded from these from these uh, structures and so on. I, th I think Luke is very interested in these socioeconomic structures, which is why Luke uses these banquet stories to talk about those, those structures. That makes me think too then of, of the resurrection stories in, oh, yeah. in Luke chapter 24. Right. Easter would be a lot more boring if we didn't have Luke because... <laughs> uh, um, uh, he eats he eats fish when he when right. he um appears to the whole group but but we have that scene with Cleopas and his companion going to Emmaus right where Jesus is hidden from their eyes until right. their eyes become open around a table and right. what do you what do you make of it such, for me it's a really beautiful story that invites right. us to think about encountering Jesus in ways beyond texts and text studies and proofs right what do you what do you make of that? What what difference does that story make for you as you think about Luke's gospel? Yeah, fascinating, fascinating story, Matt. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to preach on this text at uh, Princeton University Chapel recently. Oh, ah, great! Um, spent a good bit of time on this text. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating on so many levels. There there is the travel theme, right? Um, that that one finds not only in Luke's gospel but also in Acts of the Apostles, right? And um, throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus is traveling towards Jerusalem, but in this particular case, he's actually traveling away from Jerusalem, right? Towards Emmaus. But 
what I find especially fascinating about this story is that uh, um, Jesus meets them and uh, meets these two disciples, right? Not the prominent disciples, but these two disciples are followers of Jesus. They don't recognize him. And Jesus is explaining all these concepts, right, to them. This gives a long theological discourse. They don't, they can't figure out who he is, right? They don't know that it's Jesus. And then there is another long theological discourse. They still don't get it. They still don't know that it's Jesus. And then they get to this house, right? And they are seated at the table, right? They're all seated at the table. And then Luke says something really, really interesting. He says, Jesus takes the bread, right? Blesses it and then breaks it. And then it was in the breaking of the bread, right? As Jesus breaks the bread, that's when this light bulb goes off yeah. for these disciples, right? I mean, come on, Jesus was with them this during this long journey. He was talking at length, giving some of these uh, most profound theological discourses. They didn't they couldn't tell who he was, but then they were all seated at the table. And then when he broke the bread, that was when they realized who he was. Luke actually says it was in the breaking of the bread that they realized who he was. And then, of course, Jesus disappears, right? So this is the most profound movement. This is the movement of epiphany for the disciples. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a fascinating aspect in and of itself. But I think there's more to the story, and that is, the, Luke Timothy Johnson is actually really helpful. He says the um, breaking this this language that is um, used here. Um, Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, and then breaks it. Right, strikingly similar to the language that is used in the feeding narrative. Right, mm -hmm. Jesus does the same thing. Right, uh, and strikingly similar to the language in the last supper right so if we look at if we look at uh, the feeding of the thousands of people yes on some level it was an act of compassion but it was also a deeply political act because these were people who otherwise did not have a meal whereas the romans had a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. Jesus was providing food to people who otherwise did not have it. In doing so, he was cha challenging the political and economic structures of the empire. And so when Jesus is hosting this last supper and he says to, he says to the disciples, this is my bread, this is my body, right? Do this in memory of me. I think essentially he was saying, don't just take it lightly. Every time you take it, think of what I did, that is, I gave extended food to people who otherwise did not have it. And in doing so, I put my own body on the line. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes this bread the body of Jesus. Yeah. In extending bread to the hungry people, Jesus put his own body on the line. So coming back to the Emma story, this this act of Jesus extending the bread, breaking it for the ordinary people was so central to the identity of Jesus that, that, that it became synonymous with him. And that is why the disciples who had no idea who Jesus was the whole time immediately knew who he was once he broke the bread. Mm. Right. That's really, yeah. We've been calling our series, who do, I, who do you say that I am? And sort of what, is, what does this text say about who Jesus is? And it is what I'm hearing is this sort of this breaker of bread, this provider, this giver mm -hmm. um, is part of that image. What, what else would you say about that question? Who is Jesus in Luke's gospel? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Jesus was uh, certainly, how shall I put it, uh, uh, in a positive way, disruptor of uh, uh, oppressive uh, mm -hmm. socioeconomic structures. Um, but uh, um, Jesus wasn't, I don't think Jesus was simply interested in doing it on his own. He was giving the bread to the disciples. He was mm -hmm. handing it to them. Essentially, he was passing the baton mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to the disciples. So the church those of us who are reading the gospel, we are expected to continue the mission that uh, that Jesus has uh, mm -hmm. undertaken. Mm -hmm. What then, um, 
what what draws you personally to Luke to try to understand it better? Oh, uh, let's see. I think I think I can name a couple of things at least. Um, one, the sophisticated nature of the gospel. Luke doesn't simply say, I'm going to write an orderly account. Luke actually does a great job of presenting and telling the story of Jesus in a very engaging manner. And an aspect of Luke's telling, Luke's story of Jesus is that uh, Luke seems to be intentional about, I don't want to say intentional because that seems to assume that I know the intentions of the author. Luke seems to be making room for competing perspectives on a host of issues in the Gospels. Mm. I will name a couple for want of time. Uh, one, the identity of Jesus, right? There is the there is the um, angel and the Annunciation stories announces uh, Jesus as the son of God. And then you have the genealogy, uh, which in Luke's gospel, um, in Matthew's gospel, the genealogy goes um, goes only so far to David. But in Luke's gospel, it goes all the way back to Adam and then says, son of God, right? Jesus is the son of God. But then there are other voices that... Uh, perceive Jesus as a prophet or as uh, Joseph's son, right? All these competing perspectives. What is interesting about Luke's gospel is that uh, these different voices that articulate vastly different understandings of Jesus are sort of juxtaposed. They're placed next to each other. And I think what it does uh, is, uh, Luke's goal is that uh, Luke is presenting these varied understandings of Jesus, varied identities of Jesus, and placing them in conversation or in dialogue with each other. Mm -hmm. That's one. A second issue that I want to highlight is Luke's understanding of wealth. We talked about it really briefly earlier, which is there is Luke chapter 18, where Jesus encounters the rich ruler and pretty much essentially concludes that it's impossible for rich people to enter God's kingdom. And there's a part of me that walk, wants to walk away with it. But then Luke says, wait a minute, I'm not done yet, right? In the very next chapter, we meet another wealthy person, Zacchaeus, incredibly wealthy person, who actually right, says, I'm going to give away half my wealth to the poor. I'm going to return fourfold to anyone that I have wronged. And I want, as I read this, I want to say, wait a minute, didn't Jesus just say it's impossible for wealthy people to enter God's kingdom? And here is a, an incredibly wealthy person who actually inherits salvation, right? He's saved, not just Zacchaeus, but his entire household has been saved right there in that moment. So I think what it does again is two very different perspectives are juxtaposed, right? Um, yeah. Placed in dialogue with each other. Yeah. There's a part of me that wants that wonders why Luke might have done it. I think if I were the gospel author writing in that particular context, where I'm aware of people in the community who subscribe to vastly different perspectives, do I want to elevate one perspective at the expense of the rest? I don't think I want to. I would want to place these perspectives in dialogue because if I elevate one perspective at the expense of the rest, it leads to violence of different sorts. And I think a responsible author would not want to do that. So that's so that's what appeals to me about about uh, um, Luke's gospel. And maybe uh, I might I might also well, do we have time for one more? Sure. Um, I might also add that uh, I find really helpful um, Luke's engagement with uh, the powers of his time, but also. Luke and Jesus's engagement with his opponents. In Luke's gospel, as in Matthew, for instance, um, Jesus's primary op opponents are uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is not kind to the Pharisees. And on that note, I do want to say in, in light of uh, um, our need to be attentive to these issues, I do want to say that Pharisees are depicted in a negative light in, in the Gospels, which is not exactly consistent with the uh, historical uh, Pharisaic community. I just want to say, state that really clearly. But if we look at Luke's Gospel, Luke isn't 
calling the Pharisees, Luke's Jesus isn't calling the Pharisees names. In fact, Luke's Jesus is actually hanging out with, if I might use colloquial expression, he's spending time with the Pharisees quite a bit. And Luke's Jesus is actually sharing meals with, with the Pharisees on occasion, like Luke chapter seven, right? Uh, um, where, where we encounter the, the so-called sinful woman. Jesus is sharing meals with the Pharisees. Why is it important? What do I take from it to get to your question? What I take from it is that uh, I find this story to be significant because we live in a time where uh, political differences are very much the norm of the day. I know several people who disagree with me politically on, on economic issues, on social issues. There's a part of me that wants to distance myself from them and live in a different uh, um, different environment altogether. But I don't have that luxury. These are people who are going to churches like me, or maybe different churches, right? But they're going to churches like me. And I see them at coffee shops. I cannot just not talk to them, right? This is where Jesus's, Jesus's approach to his opponents um, becomes really helpful. What I take from Jesus's approach to the Pharisees is that uh, you don't disengage your uh, ideological or political or opponents. And you do have to engage them. But a question there is, do you continue to, do you continue to um, uh, engage them or share meals with them just so you can maintain positive relationship with them? Or do you leverage the relationship you do have with them in order to facilitate a change? Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's the latter, clearly. Yeah. I, I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to let Margaret ask it. Sure. So I want to say, um, what's the good news in Luke? How would, how would you say, if we were to ask that question of this gospel, how would Luke's gospel or Luke's Jesus answer that question? Right. I, I think uh, the empire uh, in however you define it, the empire in all its manifestations is very much real, right? Uh, and uh, But what is also real is the promise of the kingdom of God. And uh, the empire will always use its power to suppress or even extinguish the promise and the ideals of the kingdom of God. But ultimately, ultimately, um, Christ prevails over the death-dealing structures of the empire. And because Christ prevails over and defeats the death-dealing structures of the empire, the followers of Christ, those of us who are imbued with Christ consciousness, can similarly successfully challenge the death-dealing structures of the empire. Thank you. And create something new, right? I mean, there's create the, something new. Absolutely. Yeah, I, Absolutely. I think right. all the way back to uh, you mentioned the Magnificat mm -hmm. at right. the beginning, right? That vision in um, in Luke chapter one that that Mary sings about, or prays about, or prophesies yeah, right. about. Or, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And right. And and uh, we see a similar uh, promise uh, in the message of John the Baptist, right? Luke yeah. chapter three. Yeah. What's what's uh, uh, what's significant about uh, the Magnificat, but also John the Baptist's message is that uh, it sounds grandiose, right? It's not right. John the Baptist says, okay, um, uh, valleys will be filled, mountains will be um, um, brought down, right? I, I read this and I say, wait a minute, that sounds too way too ambitious. <laughs> but, but the reality is there was nothing ordinary about uh, Mary's time or about the time of John the Baptist. The economic and political oppression was so rampant that uh, a, a, an unambitious plan would not have uh, cut it. Um, so, so John is looking at this uh, this time of extreme economic inequalities. Would he simply want to trim the mountain, or would he want to level the mountain? I think it's the latter. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate your attention to the the complexity of of Luke's gospel and and to these details. You have a way of pulling out of individual passages certain things that that 
that really show this Lucan right. emphasis. I think that's going to be really helpful. And I just want to say, I just wrote on a couple of these texts for the Sojourner magazine. So, so some of these thoughts are really fresh on my mind. Fresh in your mind. Good, yeah. good. Yeah, that's a plug. People should go buy the recent issue or Sojourner, <laughs> the upcoming issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Raj, thank you so much for your time mm -hmm. and your insight, uh, for your ministry, for your teaching and your writing. We really appreciate uh, your joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed the conversation.